So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining today. It's fantastic to see so many of you here. Uh, my name is Liv and I am a researcher in the biodiversity team, biodiversity team at uh, the International Institute for Environment and Development or IIED. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar today that will showcase examples of community-based rangers in anti-poaching initiatives and discuss successes and challenges of this approach to tackling illegal wildlife trade. So as you can see, we have an absolutely fantastic agenda today, starting with Dillis Rowe, who is biodiversity team leader at IIED and also chair of the IUCN Sustainable Use and Livelihood Specialist Group, or SULI. And Dillis will be giving a brief introduction to how IID and IUCN SULI are supporting community engagement in tackling IWT, including the People Not Poaching platform. I will then introduce our speakers who are going to provide different examples of community-based rangers, including community-led patrols and all women ranger units. And then Holly Dublin, who is IID senior associate and member of the IUCN Sully Steering Committee, will then moderate a panel discussion on challenges and opportunities to supporting community-based ranger programs. And we will then end with a Q&A with all participants. So Dillis, over to you. Many thanks, Liv. Um, so just as a very brief introduction, this is a joint webinar between IAD and the IECN Sustainable Use and Livelihoods Specialist Group. And we've been working together um, for about the last five years really focusing on the role of communities in tackling illegal wildlife trade through a number of joint initiatives. And this initiative through which this webinar is hosted is, our, is the latest in, in that series. Uh, and this webinar is coming from a, a project that's funded by the UK um, government's Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund called Learning and Action for Community Engagement Against IWT, LEAP. Um, so that project is all about trying to increase the profile of local communities, improve dialogue between communities and governments and NGOs about how best to engage them in managing illegal wildlife trade. And as part of that, we've set up a web portal called People Not Poaching. Um, and through that web portal, we've been collecting case studies of initiatives that have engaged communities in tackling illegal wildlife trade and documenting the lessons from those case studies, what works, what doesn't work, and, and why, most importantly. And we've now got over 100 case studies from all around the world. And one of the most common strategies that comes out in those case studies is involving communities as rangers. Um, and so that's something that we've sort of been really interested to delve into more detail into. Um, and, and examine the different types of community ranges and the different types of approaches that have been used. So there are many examples um, of these kinds of initiatives on the People Not Poaching website. And I really do encourage you to go and have a look at that if you haven't done so already. It's just very simply www.peoplenotpoaching.org. And you can browse through all the case studies um, and as, as, uh, from all sorts of different types of community engagement initiatives not just rangers, but you'll find these ranger examples there in that database. Uh, next slide, please, Liv. So as, as we've been collecting our case studies, um, we, we've identified four kind of key approaches for uh, how, they've, how communities have been engaged as rangers. So this is not a sort of a exclusive typology, but these are the, so the four key categories that the case studies seem to fall into. So I guess the most common one is community rangers working in partnership with formal law enforcement agencies. So either with government rangers or with private sector rangers or those employed by NGOs um, and some kind of training and partnership scheme existing between the two of them. The second type is where communities themselves have decided to protect uh, the area in which they're living. They've set up their own ranger schemes, their own patrols. Uh, so these are self-motivated, self-generated. Then we've got a few case studies where um, ex-poachers have been specifically targeted um, and, and, and encouraged to become rangers 
um, as, as a way of um, engaging them in tackling illegal wildlife trade rather than being involved in illegal wildlife trade. And then finally, uh, we've got a number of cases of all women ranger groups. And I think there's quite a lot of publicity about these um, in Africa, but there are also all women ranger groups in other parts of the world. And we'll be hearing about the one in Indonesia in particular, as well as an example from Africa. So as I say, these aren't exclusive categories. There are plenty of other types, but um, these are the kinds that we'll be hearing about in the case studies that um, are gonna be presented in the webinar today. So um, I hope you enjoy hearing about some of these. And for more details, please do just go on the website and have a look at the rest of our case studies. Well, thank you so much, Dillis. So we now have five fantastic examples of community-based rangers to share with you today. Um, and as Dillis said, each one of these fits into the categories that she has just dis discussed. So first up is Dimitris Argerio, who's project and data manager for the Prelang Community Network, who are a self-formed group who patrol the Prelang Forest in Cambodia against illegal logging. So it's great to have you with us today. Could you please tell us a little bit about the Prelang Community Network um, and about how it came about? Mm -hmm. um, hello from my side as well. So um, uh, Prelang Community Network, um, it's um, a network of, um, of villagers, of communities that uh, saw the problem um, coming in, in their forest. Uh, there are many, mainly resin tappers that um, were collecting NTFP in the, in the forest and uh, saw illegal logging coming on their site in their ancestral lands. So they formed a network of, of communities that uh, started to patrol the forest um, unofficially at first and um, catching loggers uh, red-handed and uh, try to confiscate um, equipment and, um, and recording data on pen, with pen and paper. So um, there was there was too much data recorded, too much work done there to be to, to go unnoticed, and uh, we saw an opportunity, and um, we saw we offered we offered to them a, a kind of an innovative approach. We offered to them to um, uh, to somehow standardize their their data and uh, to make uh, more official uh, the work that they were doing. So. Um, uh, 15 years after there, there's so much efforts, uh, we, we formed an innovative partnership that um, formed, that um, had in, their, in the center of the, of the partnership, it was the Preland Community Network, and all around them was um, a, a supportive network of uh, a civil society organizations and NGOs uh, and university and an IT company. And, uh, we offer them to uh, uh, to create um, a, an app, a smartphone app, in order to um, to legitimize more their data and uh, have it all collected in uh, in a place where it can be accessed and um, and used for for advocacy or for proof of uh, of the situation in Prey Lang Forest. Uh, therefore, we created this app that is able to document. Um, uh, mainly like their rich biodiversity, their illegal logging and some interactions that they have either with um, loggers or with, um, uh, with the government officials. And uh, in the beginning was all, all going very well. Uh, there were some advocacy campaigns launched and their data were, are published um, in yearly monitoring reports summarizing the situation in the forest. And um, initially also government uh, rangers were joining the patrols and helping. However, at some point things turn a little bit uh, tricky and um, corruption in Cambodia did not allow this scheme to continue. So uh, right now in Cambodia there are, um, and after our last year, the release of the latest report. So uh, since last year, and uh, after we present our data on deforestation, the government starts uh, aiming us, aiming PLCN, not me personally, but they are the real heroes and they are their, the ones that play their lives. And um, trying to target them for uh, the monitoring that they are doing, delegitimizing them and uh, 
uh, in the end, they prohibit their entrance to, to their forest, uh, in essence. So they are presenting data that um, the LCN is not a legitimate group anymore and uh, attacking in, any, in every way that they can, um, saying that the data that they present are not, are not true, while we have uh, data supplemented with GPS coordinates and photos and videos and and um, the government continue to harass um, local patrollers. Uh, there has been uh, two cases at least that they have arrested people. And uh, one even instance that there is a person that uh, fled the arrest. And uh, it's some weird situation going on the, in there. And uh, the main reason is that corruption, I think. Uh, corruption that is going on and um, the illegal logging that is coming from uh, government sanctioned um, land concessions, companies adjacent to the protected area that uh, enter in the forest and uh, <clears throat> uh, try to find uh, the valuable timber, rosewoods that uh, they later uh, launder through their concessions and um, uh, traffic to Vietnam where they sell in uh, as legitimate uh, felt timber in big companies. And uh, I think that um, PLCN is the one that is uh, exposing the problem. And uh, hence, it has been in the, the target of, uh, of, of government. However, we don't, we don't, we will not stop. Uh, even though PLCN is prohibited from entering the forest, we continue with satellite monitoring, we continue with uh, monitoring the forest in the uh, uh, areas adjacent to the protected area. And um, the communities are, uh, are legitimate, it's their land. They have been trained in a peaceful conflict resolution, so they are approaching always with care um, the, the illegal loggers and they, they have skills in order to, to speak for themselves and um, to, to explain the cases. Um, to go over what we have learned is that uh, uh, Prey Lang, yes, was, was declared as a protected area also due to the petition of uh, PLCN in May 2016. However, illegal activities still continue. And what is the most challenging as I explained, is the enabling environment from, from the government, from the local authorities. And what we have learned that it works, um, it's the bottom-up approaches. It's the, um, uh, the respect to the local communities. Uh, it's the respect to the ethics, uh, the FPIC, uh, to build trust with them, to empower them, to have them as the center of, uh, of the projects and to give them uh, the lead roles and uh, just uh, follow their lead and um, support them in any way uh, that, that, that you can. Uh, in our case, what we have found also to work in a technological point is um, to enforce simple, uh, simple designs and uh, uh, simple uh, approaches that um, tackle problems of language and uh, tackle problems of technological illiteracy and to try to accommodate for all age ranges and uh, all the diversity of uh, population. Uh, this has been uh, the, the pre long case and uh, it has been really short the time, but uh, please feel free to come in contact with us. I will be happy to answer any questions uh, in the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, and for discussing such an interesting and unique example. So I'm now going to introduce Joyce Chaluba and Grenda Masonda from the North Luanga Conservation Programme in Zambia. And Joyce is a wildlife police officer and Grenda is a village game scout. Um, so welcome to you both. Um, could we start with a bit of background about how you came to be rangers? I was saying that um, to under the community, I'm a senior master hunter. And how I started, I just started as a 
My name is Brenda Msonia, a world drive community scout. I was born in 1997 in North Rangwa, a television program. Yeah, I'm a young girl from K9. Brilliant, thank you guys very much. Can you um, tell us any experiences about being a female ranger and any lessons that you have learned in the process? In Zambia, the Department of National Parks and Wildlife was the parks and mandates the monitoring of these parks and areas. Then the Sihara Busy employs the community scouts the only difference which is there is that the wildlife policy are being get paid by the government. Then what great scouts are also paid by the CRB or the community board, the community resource board. Then in Otwangwa, uh, in Otwangwa conservation program in partnership with FZS and the Department of National Parks in, in North Rwanda ecosystem since 1986 provides training, uniforms, equipment, etc. There are many things which they do provide in the country. And wildlife resources and great scouts in the ecosystem, they are all selected in the same way as we are selected as wildlife police officers. It's the same way we, in the wildlife community. All go under the same training in the process, we receive the training in the same way, we do the pressure process annually, or we do just the same things. The only difference is the payments. That's the only difference. The government also holds the community resource board and manages everything. But in conjunction with the GNPW, we have multiplied, like we have units, different units in our park in North Longer Nation Park. We have units which also occurred like units like the, our unit, K9 unit, we have monitoring officers. In in these two we have female officers and in monitoring of in monitoring we also have female officers who are learning now. They are becoming the first females to track the liners, the black liners in Zambia. Since that introduction of black liners in Zambia, the groups, the groups and units have been multiplied and we are working very well. Then we are just proud of ourselves to say, as women, we are not just seated there. We are just proud to say in Africa, it's rare to find that women are also doing different things like they are supporting conservation. So we are just proud to say, Okay, even female can do this. A woman is not just about you waiting for a man to do everything for you, but we are just proud to say we are making our area to go up around the world. Then, not only monitoring officers and the canine officers, we also have VTT or visual tracking team, but as we just call them VTT, in there also we had trainings, different trainings where women also join to track different things. Brill, thank you so much for that. That was such an interesting and unique perspective. We're now going to turn to uh, Debbie Martyr, who is technical advisor at FFI. Um, and she works in the Karinchi Seblat National Park in Indonesia. So, Debbie, who initiated the community-based ranger at Karinchi Seblat National Park and when was this? Um, <clears throat> we actually started working on a planning in 1999 and that was myself and uh, Karinchi Seblat National Park rangers, friends um, and local, my field, field assistants. I was working in the park at the time and um, we knew there was a problem, but we wanted to do something that was going to be really close collaboration between us all. Um, we'd seen other projects that 
were sort of working on their own, not partnering. And yeah, we, we set up the team. The first teams went active in, the first team went, went active in May 2000. And it's very much a partnership. So you have national park rangers and community rangers, and it's that they're very much a team. It's not a command structure in at the unit level, because everyone's got something to input, a lot of skill and yeah. Fantastic. Um so in your patrol teams, you have um you have both the community rangers and the um more formal ranges from um, more traditional, I guess, uh, law enforcement agencies. So how do they work together? Do they patrol in the teams together? Yeah, we have, the, the, norm, what we normally aim <clears throat> is three community rangers, one national park ranger, and the national park ranger, where possible, he's going to be the one who gives, who can, if they conduct law enforcement, then he's going to be the one who appears in court as a witness. And it, yeah, it gives protection, level of protection to the community rangers as well. Um, for investigations, that's almost entirely community rangers um, because they speak local languages. Most of the rangers, national park rangers do as well. But the community members of the team are able to collect information, some, some more sensitive information, perhaps better than the National Park Ranger members of the team, but we're a team. And when they're patrolling, they're wearing their own uniform. And it's, I mean, what we always say is it's FFI and Creech Slack National Park joining together to support a team that can have its own very specific priorities, not necessarily an NGO's priorities or um, a National Park's priorities, but very specific wildlife and habitat conservation priorities. Fantastic, thank you. And could you tell us um, whether the community rangers have been effective and how you've been measuring that? Um, <laughs> um, well, first of all, they're part of the community. And so they're able to get their, their own villages on side. Um, a lot of them, particularly in the early days, people who were non-forest non-timber forest product collectors. So they had a huge amount of skill in that respect and amazing tracking skills, which have become more and more, yeah. You know, you walk down a down a, a, a trail and they'll see, see a signs of a person and half the time they can even work out roughly who they are and where they've come from, um, just by the way they've made a camp or something. Um, when we started out, we didn't know anything. We knew what we were seeing, but we didn't know how to address it. And that was very much a learning process. And it was driven both by national park rangers and by the community rangers. Um, so you develop a very close team because they were, everyone's been learning together as time has gone on. Um, what we found was that poaching threat for tiger was far, far higher than anyone had suspected. We found that human-tiger conflict um, could very often result in the death of a tiger, but not necessarily, didn't have to be a serious conflict, just a tiger moving through farmland, and that might be exploited by a poacher, for instance. Um, it swings and roundabouts, it's bumpy on occasion, so you get spikes in poaching occurring, and you can sometimes spot these developing by rumours, reports of rising prices for rising black market prices, um, developing information networks around forest edge farmers. They become friendly with the patrol team and they'll tell the guys if they think somebody suspicious is being going into the forest. And so, uh, yeah, by, yeah, over the last few years, we reckon that 80, 85% of snares we've destroyed um, have been on the basis of tip-offs or information passed on to the to the ranger team. Um, yeah. Um, and finally, what are some of the challenges you've experienced and what key lessons learned would you pass on to others? 
think probably the first challenge <laughs> we learned was to, you know, not just protect your team members, to, to protect their informants. That was literally when we just started out. And it was our first ever Tiger Law Enforcement uh, case. And um, the investigator who uncovered the case introduced himself using the name of somebody, a chap had said, oh, go and ask Mr. Smith about something. And somebody got arrested and Mr. Smith, yeah, the uh, informant had quite serious threats made against him. So we've learned that you protect not only your ranger team, but you also protect the villagers who help you. I think that's, it develops trust and they know that it's safe to talk to the guys. Um, we've learned that we keep things very tight, very close. We don't pass information out widely unless it's going to help another landscape. Um, or unless somebody can do something about it that the teams can't do. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we want to be careful, we want to be practical, we want to be able to measure results. Um, terribly practical, terribly simple and careful. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. I'm now going to introduce our fourth speaker, Chip Chirara, who is project manager of the Zambezi Valley Biodiversity Project. Um, so Chip, could you tell us a little bit about the community rangers involved in the project, um, including those who used to be poachers? In terms of community rangers in Zimbabwe, I'm just going to give some, some examples. Um, the, the concept was initiated by, uh, by the government of Zimbabwe through the Parks and Wildlife Management Authority, um, of course, together with local authorities, when um, the campfire program was, was initiated around um, 1989. So um, this is when uh, also the community-based natural resource management concept was, was introduced in the country. So when you look at um, the selection process in terms of how, how, how do you select a ranger and uh, actually to come back to your question of um, examples of um, rangers have been poachers. Um, actually, these are people that have been living in in in, um, in 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 the areas close to national parks, and most of the time they are also involved in um, utilization of the resource uh, illegally. And um, so, in terms of the, the the selection process, these are the people that that uh, we've got examples of rangers. We have been selected. We used to be um, utilizing the resource illegally, so you, you'd call them poachers. Um, but some of these have been trained. Um, they are good in terms of tracking animals. Uh, actually, in their previous life, as, as, as poachers, but now they are quite useful in tracking poachers uh, because they are used to living in the area. They know the area very well. They know how to track. So trekking is trekking. So they've been trekking animals. Now they can be used to trek um, poachers. Um, when you look at, at, at the rangers that we have, some of them are, are volunteers from what we call the ESCs, the environmental subcommittees. Um, while others are employed by the local authorities and some are employed by safari operators in the area. We've got the concept where uh, in the country, um, safari operators work with the local authority, that is the rural district council, uh, in terms of uh, patrols, uh, especially in um, in areas in, in protected areas that we classify as safari areas. Um, in terms of incentives, um, the rangers they receive training, uh, uniforms, other equipment used in patrols. They also get experience. If they are volunteers, it means uh, um, they are now ready to be employed by safari operators. And uh, 
and the RRDCs. And this happens quite often uh, to have when, when the recruitment process is started. Um, normally, people that have been volunteers are, are taken first. Thanks so much, Chip. And um, how effective um, do you think this approach has been? Um, and do you have any lessons you would pass on to others trying to implement something similar? Yeah, um, for us, community rangers are, are, are quite effective uh, because um, they can um, patrol outside the, the buffer zones and they know the areas um, very well. So from our experience, they're they are, they are quite effective as they carry out uh, extended patrols uh, most of the time. Of course, they need, they need more resources to do that. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, the evidence to support that, uh, we, we normally our rangers, they, they produce monthly reports that are submitted through the rural district councils. Um, and we, we've got information on the number of days that they spend in the field in terms of patrols, uh, number of arrests, recoveries made, and, and, and also we collect all this information on a monthly basis, especially in our project. And this feeds to uh, the head office of the Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. So all this information is collected. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chip. So I'm now going to introduce our final speaker, Mr. Suprianto, who is head of Bogani Nani Waterboni National Park in Indonesia. And he will be joined by Mr. Ahmed Prabadi, who is National Project Manager of the CIWT project. Selamat malam. Uh, saya Suprianto dari Taman Nasional Bogani Nani Wartabuni. Saya mohon maaf, saya memakai bahasa Indonesia karena bahasa Inggris saya kurang bagus. Ya, yeah. uh, di Taman Nasional, Bogani Nani Wartabuni, biasanya kita ada masyarakat mitra polhut yang laki-laki. Dan kami mencoba untuk melibatkan eh, perempuan sebagai eh, model eh, bagaimana eh, mereka agar bisa berkontribusi dalam pengelolaan Taman Nasional. Ide ini kami sampaikan kepada uh, Kementerian uh, KLHK melalui Direktorat Kakum dan difasilitasi oleh proyek uh, CIWT pembiayaannya. Lalu kita uh, latih dan kita bentuk uh, PIMP pada bulan Oktober 2020. Dan uh, hanya 15 orang yang proses seleksinya kita sampaikan kepada teman-teman di tingkat resort dan seksi wilayah untuk mensosialisasikan dan mensosialisasikan dan mencari kandidat untuk dilatih menjadi PIMP. Nah, setelah itu Setelah rekomendasi dari seksi wilayah dan resort, kita terpilih ada 15 orang yang mewakili seluruh resort wilayah. Kita terbitkan surat untuk kita lakukan pelatihan. Pelatihan dilakukan selama 15 eh, selama 9 hari. Next selama 9 hari ya dengan uh, berbagai materi yaitu pengenalan Taman Nasional Bogani Nani Wartabuni wawasan mengenai konservasi atau mengelola rumah bersama dari uh, instruktur bumi edukasi Bogor juga ada manajemen konflik pencegahan dan pemberantasan satwa liar yang dari Direktorat uh, Kakum juga pembuatan ekoprint yang dilakukan oleh Universitas Kristen Jutawiata Yogyakarta. 
dan materi-materi uh, lain terkait dengan uh, perencanaan dan sebagainya. Nah, setelah uh, dalam kegiatan uh, pelatihan dan pembentukan, ini difasilitasi oleh proyek uh, CIWT yang menyediakan uh, seragam dan keperluan untuk uh, kegiatan di lapangan. Setelah itu, uh, peserta PIMP kembali ke resort masing-masing untuk memperkenalkan diri dan mengenal wilayah kerja yang akan menjadi tempat tugasnya. Di tahun 2020, mereka sebagai volunteer, namun di tahun 2021, Balai Taman Nasional menyediakan pembiayaan untuk operasional dalam jumlah yang terbatas. Jadi mereka lebih banyak tugasnya untuk pendampingan kelompok-kelompok yang sudah kita bentuk, melakukan pendekatan kepada kelompok anak-anak muda maupun kaum ibu untuk memberikan keterampilan atau kegiatan lain yang bisa menjadi alternatif pencarian mata ini pencarian pekerjaan. Nah, mereka tidak dilakukan tidak diberi senjata karena mereka lebih banyak bekerja di luar kawasan. Kalau misalnya dalam pekerjaan ini lebih banyak kegiatan yang bersifat preventif yaitu koordinasi atau anjang sana kepada kelompok-kelompok masyarakat mengikuti kegiatan pemasangan papan informasi maupun peningkatan kapasitas dan memperkenalkan program-program dari Taman Nasional kepada masyarakat. Sehingga peran mereka lebih dominan lebih dominan yang bersifat preventif dalam kegiatan penegakan hukum yaitu mengajak masyarakat yang selama ini sudah terlanjur eh, mengelola lahan di dalam kawasan, kita ajak dengan program kita seperti pemulihan ekosistem kolaborasi dan eh, pengelolaan jasa wisata, sehingga mereka eh, ke depannya memiliki alternatif eh, pekerjaan sebagai solusi supaya mereka tidak merusak hutan. Ya, eh, kehadiran eh, PIMP ini eh, di masyarakat itu adalah mencoba merubah pola pikir yang selama ini eh, mereka bergantung kepada kawasan dengan merusak. Ini kita coba dengan program-program yang eh, lebih nanti pemanfaatan hasil hutan bukan kayu, pengelolaan wisata, maupun alternatif keterampilan yang lain. Nah, dari kegiatan ini, hal yang sudah nampak bahwa mereka sudah mulai dikenal dan mereka sudah mencoba mendekati PIMP terkait dengan misalnya ada Tarsius yang dia pelihara mereka bersedia untuk melepaskan kembali. Jadi mereka cukup membantu dalam upaya mencegah terjadinya perburuan liar maupun kegiatan perambahan dan illegal logging. Nah, hal-hal yang yang kita sarankan untuk mengatasi permasalahan bahwa eh, masyarakat harus kita berikan eh, alternatif yang bisa meningkatkan ekonomi mereka dengan tidak merusak kawasan hutan. Sehingga eh, kawasannya tetap terjaga dan masyarakat eh, memperoleh eh, nilai ekonomi. Nah, catatan dari eh, Pak Susetio Iriono, Direktur dari JIWT, bahwa 
pelatihan inspiratif mitra polisi kehutanan diharapkan menjadi role model percontohan yang bisa mengubah kegiatan-kegiatan yang ilegal di dalam kawasan menjadi mitra yang bisa melindungi satwa satwa yang ada di dalam kawasan dan menjadi inspirasi untuk menciptakan alternatif-alternatif mata pencarian. Demikian, terima kasih. Thank you so much, Mr. Cipriante. And thank you to all of our speakers for sharing such a breadth of experiences with us today. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Holly Dublin, who is going to moderate our panel discussion um, on challenges and opportunities to support community-based rangers. So Holly, over to you. Thanks very much, Liv, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all on the um, on the webinar with us. Um, I'd like to ask if the three panelists could please turn their cameras on now while we go through the introductions. And also I would like to make the offer to everyone on the webinar to please feel free to place questions in the chat as we go along. Um, we're going to try and pick up as many as possible uh, towards the end of our session. So let me introduce our three speakers. The first speaker is Simpson Kurigov. Simpson is a native son of Damarland in Northwest Namibia. He began his career at Save the Rhino Trust in Namibia in 1991. And I can say I've known him for a very long time in doing that. Simpson has had an amazing career going all the way from beginning as a tracker, becoming the director of research, then the director of field operations, and then became the chief executive officer in 2014. Simpson also co-founded Namibia's Conservancy Rhino Ranger Incentive Program, and he is currently an active member of IUCN's African Rhino Specialist Group. So Simpson, welcome. Um, our, next, our next, <laughs> yes, welcome. Our next panelist is Rohit Singh. Rohit is the Director of Wildlife Enforcement and Zero Poaching for WWF. Rohit began his career almost two decades ago and has had incredible experience in tackling wildlife crime. He actually started his career as a zookeeper at the Bear Rescue Center in India before joining up with all of us working on tackling wildlife crime. Rohit now plays a pivotal role in pushing for governments to adopt wildlife crime prevention approaches. He's super active. He's also Asia's representative in the International, Game Ranger, the International Ranger Federation and has been the lead on the largest ever survey of rangers across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And he'll be talking a bit about this, I hope. It's an amazing, amazing survey. Our last speaker on the panel is Dan Bucknell. Um, Dan is the executive director of Task Trust and he's worked in conservation for over 20 years in Africa and Asia. And Dan has worked primarily with gorillas and Asian elephants, but also more broadly than that. So let me welcome all three of our speakers. Um, what we're going to do is work through a round of questions, um, starting, starting with Simpson, and then I'll move on through the panel. So Simpson, again, welcome. Simpson, we all know that you've been working with community rangers for a very, very long time, having of course started out as one yourself. But can you explain a little bit about lessons that you've learned over all that time in terms of key challenges that have been involved and what you've found has truly built the amazing community commitment that you have there now? Over to you, Simpson. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, yeah, as Holly correctly said, I've been working for quite a long time with the communities. And what I have learned in the beginning was, um, <clears throat> well, it's in the blood of our forefathers. They have been conservationists all the year. And it's where the training comes from, that it comes to us. <clears throat> People in the past actually poach for me not for the legal wildlife trade or whatever, just for me, food, that was it. Um, and when we start, when the poaching actually start, that's where 
we actually, uh, that was already in conservation and the CBRM program when it starts with, with Namibia, people actually, the communities got the ownership of wildlife. They have been working with wildlife, but it was not theirs, but now it's theirs. And because of this ownership, people feel that they have to really protect that wildlife because they benefit from them. Um, especially when it comes to community game guards, it's, it's not the government that employ community game guards, it's the traditional leaders that appoint them and say, you are the people that has to look after our wildlife so that we can benefit from them. And while this community game guard uh, project was running, we actually, when the government give the rights to the people for rhinos and, and stuff like that, we said, okay, now we want people that we call rhino rangers, that we will train and that will be responsible for looking after the rhinos for the communities. And these people actually are the ones that today standing in front of us. A rhino to be a ranger is not an easy task, it's very hard. But what happened in our Northwestern region in, in, in Namibia is, it, it's a small area, we've got lots of wildlife. People know each other very well. So my son and my neighbor's son will go together to either poach or to look after the wildlife. And if something wrong happened, one of them will tell us what happened. And that's how the intelligence also has started now with, 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 within the communities. And today I can guarantee you, I will sit in my office and my phone will ring. And it's an old lady sitting in the village that's phoning me and wants to tell me that they have seen a vehicle that's not from their area. So intelligence start right in the villages from our people. The people know what they're doing. They know actually. Okay, thanks, Simpson. That is really good. And actually a wonderful lead in to my next question, which is to Rohit. Um, Rohit, kind of a, a complicated question, um, but Simpson has now touched on it, and, and Debbie also spoke about this a bit. You know, you've worked as a ranger and worked on ranger welfare issues for such a long time, and in the survey that you did of rangers, have you heard about any problems that were associated with local community members becoming involved in informing on sometimes their friends and their family, and therefore in some ways potentially putting themselves at risk? And if you have heard about that, how have you felt it's best to deal with it? And who do you think has the responsibility to safeguard community rangers from retribution um, if they're being perceived to actually be monitoring and reporting on the activities of their own community? Thank, thanks, Holly. Uh, first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, before I answer your question, let me just uh, give some sort of a context to this problem. Uh, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge it's a very complex relationship, rangers and communities. We have to protect biodiversity, we have to protect ecosystem services. At the same time, we also have to protect the rights of indigenous people and local communities. We also need to understand that rangers do not operate in an ideal situation. There is a context and some of that was uh, you know, touched upon by my friend from Cambodia, because I lived in Cambodia for seven years, so I know exactly what he's talking about. Corruption. Indonesia talked about it, you know, uh, the activities happening inside the park. So let's keep that context in mind. Now, coming specifically to the survey, as you said in the introduction, that it was the largest ever survey done on rangers. It was unfortunate that we couldn't uh, sort of did do the same survey for communities. If we could ask communities, what do you feel about ranges? That would have been great, but you know there are limitations. Uh, we did not had any specific question on sharing sensitive information, but we did ask a few questions that are sort of give us good insight to this topic. Uh, so more than eighty percent rangers said they can't deliver their duties without the support of rangers. But 37% of those rangers also said communities consider us as enemies. And we have recently done an analysis, which is really interesting, Holly. And, and, and I was shocked when we did this analysis, though it's just from one country. We compared the welfare conditions of rangers with the stress. 
And I always thought the stress comes, oh, I'm not able to see my families or I don't have clean drinking water. You know, the maximum stress comes from negative relationship with community. And now I can think of it. If you are yeah. living in a remote location, surrounded by the villagers who don't necessarily like you, you are living under constant fear and stress. So what this all shows, it's a complex relationship and it needs to be dealt accordingly. Now, coming specifically to your question with regard to uh, information, I think if you look at, and it's probably uh, Simpson can, can connect with me on this, that for the last several decades, I would say this notion of communities are eyes and ears that organically sort of gives the impression that communities are only source of information. And I think we have to move away from it. Communities are not just source of information. They are partner in conservation. If you do not bring them as a partner, you will not be able to address the fundamental problem, which Debbie also touched upon, is the trust deficit between rangers and community. Information can be a byproduct of that good trust between rangers and communities. And in our survey, we found out that that's the major problem. There is a trust deficit between rangers and communities. They don't trust, rangers don't trust communities, communities don't trust rangers. So we really need to work on the trust. And once we work on the trust, then we can safeguard the communities, then we can safeguard the ranger rights, because when we talk about rights, we have to talk about rights of both parties and, and making it safe for both. Uh, and, and I think that's where we need to move. And, and, and uh, one of the initiatives that is going on currently, or oh, that's going to start soon, and, and uh, hopefully you and Dillis will be part of that, and, and you have agreed, we need to understand this complex relationship. We really don't understand this. There has been a lot of work on ranges, there has been a lot of work on communities, but there has not been really good cross-pollination of how these two things work together. So if we can understand this better, through Universal Ranger Support Alliance, which is a global alliance which was established last year, then we can really address some of these issues of how do you strengthen the trust and then intelligence or sensitive information can be a byproduct of that. Let's not start with eyes and ears. I think, I think that it's the time to move away from that. Thanks, Rohit. Um, I saw Simpson doing a lot of nodding. So um, I know that what you're talking about there is so fundamental and so much what we've been all trying to see and respect, which is that these are about relationships. It's not about somebody's just their job. It's about the relationships and the building of relationships. And like any relationships we have, you don't just get given trust because somebody tells you you're a law enforcement officer, you should be trusted. You don't just get given trust because you're an elderly person in a, in a village, you build trust. So I know a lot of questions are gonna be coming up around this and I, I wanna move through and we're gonna come back around um, to follow up on some of these things with a bit more depth. I wanna, I wanna go to Dan because what I want to kind of sort of sew our whole picture together so that we really understand a bit about like how have people been rewarded? You know, and is that an important part of what happens or do people have other motivations? So Dan, just to come to you, um, as an organization, I think people know your, your awards quite well. Um, you give that annual Tusk Wildlife Ranger Award, which so many of us feel is just so incredibly important. Um, what kinds of things do you look for when you're deciding that? What kind of criteria do you use? And is it an important thing in terms of sort of what we've been hearing from our other two colleagues? What, what does it really take to make a person one of these rangers? And how do we acknowledge that? Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Holly. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Um, so yes, the, the, the Tusk Wildlife Ranger Award is one of the, the three awards now in the annual Tusk Conservation uh, Awards. Um, it was added in 2015. Um, the awards themselves were created in 2013, um, but it was added uh, five years ago. Um, very much to, to, to give recognition to the vital role um, that rangers are playing on the ground um, in conservation, to give them the recognition that they deserve. Um, the Tusk Conservation Awards are, are very much about um, giving, giving recognition to, to people who sacrifice so much um, in, in the name of conservation. 
Um, because um, what we have found over the years is that, you know, uh, ranges um, are generally, you know, and widely undervalued, undervalued by their national governments, undervalued um, in their local communities. Um, it's a tough job, um, often taking um, taking people, taking rangers, community scouts away from their families for extended periods of time, putting them in great danger. I mean, we you know we've often heard the uh, the, the statistics of however many rangers are, are killed on the front line um, serving duty. You know, as many as a hundred per year. Um, so yeah, the the Task Wildlife Ranger Award is is all about um, delivering greater greater recognition and value for that, so that so that they these uh, people do come to be recognised by their their host governments by um, by the communities, and and most importantly, that being a, a, a ranger or a community scout is you know is is a very respected um, uh, profession. I mean that's what that's that's what we're trying to sort of counter in many parts um, of Africa. Um, so, as Tusk, our focus is is just on Africa. So the the Tusk Wildlife Ranger Award is is just for um, for, for rangers in Africa. I mean, it's not just for for rangers. It's for um, it's for community scouts, people who work in in areas of intelligence gathering. Um, it can be for for wildlife department scouts. Um, it can even be for for work in in monitoring research. Um, it, it, it doesn't extend to, to private security companies, um, so it is all sort of community or, or, or government-led um, uh, forces. But, um, but yeah, they must be an active ranger and a citizen of an, an African country um, to, to be eligible, and they must have worked for more than 10 years in the field. Um, and um, it is particularly for um, a, a, an, an individual. Um, and um, we like to focus on, on the individual so that they can, can provide that sort of inspirational role model for, 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 for their wider community. Um, and so the criteria that the judging panel looked for is, is that level of sort of respect um, within, their, within their teams, within, with, uh, among their colleagues, um, the extent to which they, they have carved their career, grown up through the ranks, come from the grassroots and, and worked through the ranks um, to, to get into a sort of a, a position um, where they can inspire others. Um, obviously looking at their track record in, in terms of the extent to which they have influenced policy for whether it's for range of welfare, wildlife protection, um, wildlife management uh, measures and so on, um, you know, looking at their, their record in, in protecting and safeguarding human rights as well, which is of course a very important dimension on all of this. Um, the level of mentorship that they provide for new recruits, um, the extent to which they are a role model, um, and, and so on. Um, so th there's a variety of criteria that the, 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 the judging panel um, look for. Um, and we've seen some, some very strong high caliber um, winners of the award um, in, in recent years, over the past five years that, that the award has been, has been given. Well, thanks very much, Dan. And I think thanks also for providing quite a nice segue because I want to come back to Simpson. Um, Dan, you guys are giving these awards to people at the pinnacle of their career, right? These are, these are the ones that are recognized in Africa right now, you know, people that have had a career, but they all started somewhere. And Simpson is a wonderful person to, to talk with us about this because you also touched a little bit, Dan, on the fact that the, what, what is required of a community ranger is in a vast number of skills now, right? It's not just as simple as you go out there and patrol all over the place. You've got human rights issues, you have many issues. So I just wanna to go to Simpson and ask you Simpson, what kind of training you know, have you felt is really necessary? And what's involved in that? Particularly, how do you avoid some of these problems that have been made public about rangers that sometimes overstep their remit and sometimes push a bit too far with the community. You know, we know in many places that one of the issues where rangers are in fact armed, sometimes men and arms can be very problematic for local communities. So do you have safeguards in place for people that maybe don't know those bounds? So give us a little bit about the background training that you think is important and how do we really work to keep people within you know, the proper human rights frameworks? Over to you, Simpson. In, um, in Holly. Um, first of all, as uh, Rohit said, uh, the trust, develop the trust within the 
community. I would say community game bars coming out from the community. The respect is always there. It's just now that they have to go at one step ahead and of, have been pushed one step ahead by the elders to stand up for them, looking after the wildlife that they have been given by the government. Because the ownership is now with the people, with the communities here in Namibia, which is a very good example and a very good thing that happened. The communities own the wildlife. They know it's theirs. They send their sons out to go and look after the, the same like their cattle. And these sons have been teach at home. An elder is an elder. Respect must always be there. If someone did something wrong, the elders, that's the other thing. And, and that's where it comes that we don't really get all the stories of rangers people, rangers and beach up people and things. And as Holly also correctly mentioned, uniforms and the people. And, and when somebody is having a, a firearm and wearing a uniform, like a binoculars, they will be carrying a camera, they will be carrying a GPS and a smart device. And that's it. And that tools they use for monitoring the wildlife and not for any uh, beating up people or shooting equipment that they use for information. And we also, when we do the skills transfer and train them, we give them training like scene of the crime handling, rhino monitoring, and even anti-poaching, and then also tourism. So they have to work with tourists to get benefits. They have to do anti-poaching. But in our case, we don't really do anti-poaching. These guys are just monitoring, so we train them. But we do um, environment and tourism, for law enforcement, and um, um, all those other things. Our people are just monitoring and reporting back. Yeah, no, I was just saying, thanks. That's, that's a really useful sort of um, look at it. And I think an important distinction, which people are not always aw aware of, that sometimes community game guards are carrying arms and are actual law enforcement officers. And other times community guards are more monitors, uh, keeping track of things and um, you know, reporting any necessary law enforcement actions to authorities. So I think that does make for a distinction, but as you rightly said, your men and women are trained with a lot of um, different skills because they have so many different needs. So I wanna go to Rohit and, and talk a little bit more, Rohit, about this issue of where communities actually begin to take that role of law enforcement. And they actually now start being perceived as being involved with law enforcement. Is that helping out in situations where communities and the state-led law enforcement agency may not have the best relationships? Is it something that we would see as a positive addition? Over to you, Rohit. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Holly. Uh, I think first, uh, sort of, there is a sort of a misconception when we say rangers, they are only state actors, which is wrong. Like when we say rangers, we are talking about lot of community rangers, a lot of IPLC rangers. Uh, in our own survey, uh, the 7,000 rangers we interviewed, 34% were from the nearby villages. So they are the sort of local community representatives. Um, and I think we have to just, like we had representatives from Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia, there are not enough government rangers. So you have to have community rangers on the ground. Uh, but, and then it definitely helps bringing the community rangers because it's one of the sort of way to strengthen the relationship or build the trust between rangers and communities. But again, I, I would like to just talk about, um, you know, the broader enabling conditions. And I can give example uh, when we are, and I'm referring back to my survey, you know, having female ranger is one thing, but if you do not have the enabling conditions to retain the female rangers, it's not gonna work. And it goes same with local communities. If you do not have the enabling conditions, if there is discrimination happening within the patrol teams, if an IPLC ranger is only used as a porter or is only used to cook food, you know, and that sort of thing, that discrimination happening, or there is a discrimination happening in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the facilities that are being provided to them, or uh, they, they are, their life is at risk when they are not the law enforcement officer, they are facing the equal threat. 
what the state rangers are facing. So I think enabling conditions are equally important when we talk about uh, bringing community rangers. It does definitely help. And finally, I think let's keep one thing in mind. Uh, by 2030, if we want to protect 30% of the planet, whether it's protected or conserved, Mike, I, I can't disclose the number, but we have just completed the census. There are, and just to give you the number, there are more hairdressers in the UK than rangers in the world. So, so you, it's, there's, it's not a choice. It's an imperative that we have to engage communities. No government is gonna recruit millions and millions of rangers overnight. It's not just about boots on the ground, it's also about flip-flops on the ground. We have to have some sort of mechanism, monitoring mechanism on the place, and we have to engage communities in doing that. Thanks, Rohit. I always love your incredible energy. And I think that, you know, what we're all feeling here is just that, that incredible importance coming on through, which is that without communities, what, what will happen with the CBD targets, you know, the post 2020, they won't happen. So I think governments are increasingly definitely recognizing that these partnerships are no longer something that you just see as a specialized area, but something that is absolutely mandatory basically going forward. So thanks for that. I'm gonna come back, Dan, with one last question to you. And then I see that we're getting a lot of nice um, questions onto the chat that Dillison and Liv will pick up on. So let me just come back to you quickly, Dan. Um, in addition to giving the wonderful awards that Tusk gives, you also support a number of projects and programs that, that I'm aware of. Um, listening to the conversation that we've been having here, do you have a few key lessons that you think you've learned um, through these programs and, and projects about what's worked and what hasn't? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, picking up on a sort of a, a theme that's uh, been mentioned throughout is that obviously community engagement um, is, is, is really key here. Um, and, you know, picking up on Rohit's point about the sort of the, the preconditions, the enabling conditions for, for um, community scouts to work effectively. I think what, what we've seen is that um, for community scouts and that approach to be most effective, it has to be embedded within a much wider, more comprehensive sort of conservation strategy with wider community benefits. Um, I think where what the projects that we tend to support across Africa are those that combine law enforcement with community support. And community scouts can often be the, the, the bridge between the law enforcement and the local community. Um, I think where we've seen um, illegal wildlife trade being tackled most effectively, it's where it's where you've got that strong community buy-in. Um, the community is really sort of acting almost like that extra sort of buffer zone to um, to protected areas. Um, so, so I think that that is absolutely key. Um, picking up on Simpson's point about um, training, training also is 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 essential. Um, you know, your your putting rangers, community scouts um, into potentially very perilous um, situations. So they, they have to have um, robust and rigorous training. And we've seen, seen that that can be, can be game changing. Um, we've picked up on the, the theme um, in the discussion about human rights. Um, human rights is, 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 is an important element in the training of, of community scouts and rangers these days. It was um, a, a, a very important um, precondition in a, um, a big event we, we did last year um, called the Wildlife Ranger Challenge, which supported um, uh, over a hundred protected areas across across Africa at a time when they really needed um, extra resources to come through the sort of the uh, the funding deficit caused by by COVID. Um, so yes, human rights was it was was very important there, and we we facilitated a number of briefings on that. Um, but also what we've seen, you know, as uh, I mean, Simpson mentioned about sort of scene of crime procedure and all of this to um, to facilitate arrests and um, ensure that, um, you know, uh, we see the prosecutions for, for wildlife crime. Um, it, what we've also seen is really important to train um, people who are going into these um, sort of potentially perilous situations in how to you know, how to successfully um, apprehend um, poachers, um, how to tackle um, illegal wildlife activity at the right sort of uh, and the most appropriate level with the most appropriate force and ultimately to, you know, to, to observe correct arrest procedure. Um, 
for example, you know, how, how, how to avoid a potential ambush from, um, from poachers, that sort of thing. I mean, I think, you know, many rangers um, have lost their lives um, uh, on the front line and, you know, possibly some could be avoided if, if they'd been able to observe correct, correct um, arrest procedure. Um, so, um, so training is training is vital. Um, uh, the, the last thing I, I'd sort of go on to say is, um, and this is linked back to the sort of the first point about sort of community engagement. Um, it's the very key message that um, that rangers aren't, of course, all about you know stopping poaching and countering illegal activity. They do so much more besides um, that. You know, uh, whether rangers or community scouts, they can be this 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 bridge between the community and and the. Um, uh, and, and law enforcement. Many rangers and community scouts are engaged in um, human wildlife conflict mitigation, for example. Um, I don't think that's come up yet as, 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 as a key element of, of their role. And I know that, you know, IIED um, did some very important research showing that um, where people suffer the consequences of um, human wildlife conflict, um, that this can in fact be a, a, a key driver for wildlife crime. Um, and so community scouts, rangers have a key role in, in helping prevent that too. Um, and that's an, a, an extra and very important um, dimension to, to community support. Um, so much yeah. more besides, I'm sure, I'm sure more will come out in the-, in the Well, in the thanks, Dan. Those are some wonderful examples. And I think what, you know, I, I feel uh, as I hand over the panel um, in just a moment to Dillis and, and Liv, I really feel that you know our our interest from IIED and Suli's side has really been to highlight the absolutely indisputable critical role of communities in combating illegal wildlife trade. And whether there are more or less of them than hairdressers, what we know is we need more of them. And that's not to say that we don't need more hairdressers even if no one can get to them during the COVID. So I want to take the opportunity to thank so much the three of you. Um, you're all stars and you've all done amazing work in your own right. I'm going to turn over to Dillis and Liv because we've had some fabulous uh, questions coming up for both uh, the previous speakers as well as you. So please all hang on there and over to you Liv and Dillis. Thanks panel. Great, thanks so much Holly for that. And thank you all to our excellent panelists as well. So quite a few of the questions um, were targeted around uh, challenges of being a female ranger and sort of societal pressures that might come with that. Um, so I know we have some of the community forest women rangers from the Indonesia um, program online. And I wondered if they would like to share a little bit um, about their experiences of being a female ranger. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is a women-based community forest ranger in Bogani Naniwarta Bone National Park from Indonesia. Become a ranger since 2020, it's a big deal and a great opportunity for all of us. That's we're doing more to protect our art at the point. The interesting experience of being a ranger was when we did uh, the planning for the first time and it was a voluntary activity. From there, we learned that from the art, we can even do anything as long as it's the art. Long story short. We have uh, our challenges from the preparation and illegal logging counter poachers. Actually, we have our own problem here, such as uh, um, eating traditions. Half of society in North so animals who are trying to be protect. Some people trying to protect them, some people trying to eat them. Thanks very much. Um, the same yeah. question to if Joyce and Grenda are still online. Um, do you have any particular challenges um, that you faced being a female ranger um, as part of the North Luranga Conservation Programme? Yes, uh, challenges from the prep uh, trailers and illegal logging, uh, counter poachers. Actually, like what I say, we had our own problem here, such as uh, eating traditions. 
because uh, half of saving to be protect like Maleo, even the Anoa. So uh, we can say this like we're trying to protect them, but some people trying to either that's our own problem here. That's challenges for us, all of us. Brilliant, thank you. Maybe we'll move on to um, a question for our panelists then um, from Dillis. A couple of really interesting questions that have come up for the panel, um, but quite a few of which have been answered over the course of the panel discussion. So one around whether community ranges can ever replace traditional ranges. And I guess just based on Rohit's comment about how few ranges there are in total, the answer to that is actually we need both of them, not, not either or. Um, there, there's questions about how to keep ranges motivated, and I think Simpson talked nicely to that. But one that I think is really interesting, actually two that have come up towards the end that I think are, are very interesting. Uh, one is around, um, are there any kind of advantages and disadvantages to the different types of community ranges, given that there's such a wide spectrum of them, from monitors um, to scouts to sort of fully armed full-on rangers, and, and is there sort of any e existing kind of analysis of the advantages and disadvantages associated with those different types of rangers? And then a second one is about whether there are any safeguards, existing safeguards for community rangers. Who's responsible for them if things go wrong? So maybe I can just pose those two questions um, to the three panelists and, and either answer one or, or both of those if, if you have perspectives on those. Rohit, perhaps we can go to you first on um, the, the kind of um, issues, opportunities and challenges associated with different types and whether there has been any analysis done of that and then also on the safeguards issue. Thanks, Dillis. And then I think it's a, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not aware of any specific analysis that look into, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages. I guess it's it's very context specific. Uh, if you look at the region where I have spent uh, 15 years of my career, Southeast Asia, majority of the community ranges do not carry firearms. Uh, has it been very effective or not? It's hard to say in some countries like in, in Indonesia, it has made some difference. Uh, uh, in some countries, it has not made much difference and we are losing uh, wildlife species. Uh, and, and it is again, because of the broader context. So I think there has not been any study and maybe this is, I want to invite people on this call. We have this data. We interviewed 7,000 rangers and each ranger was asked 194 questions. So please help us to analyze it. And, and this will help us to understand uh, Maybe we can filter some information of the rangers who came from the nearby villages. Are they, do they have different perception about authorities? So it can be an interesting analysis. On the second question, um, and I think that's a very important question. And I think anybody who is supporting local communities for going out on patrol, I think it's, it's must that we make sure that they have the right training, they have the right equipment and they have all the safety measures in place before we send them out on patrol. Yes, they may not be enforcing the law, but they are facing the same threat which state rangers are facing because our own survey says that 80% rangers have faced life-threatening situation. So the risk is out there. So I think it is really important that we, we start addressing those issues before we send community rangers out. And I think there has been a lot of capacity building, a lot of training materials and standards, but a lot of that material has been focused on state ranges. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to now move towards developing similar standards or similar training material for IPLC rangers. Thanks, Rohit. And Dan and Simpson, do you have any thoughts on these, particularly on the issue of around safeguards? I mean, both of you work for organizations that either fund mm -hmm or directly employ ranges. Do you have any thoughts as to, um, from a safeguarding perspective, who's responsible for those ranges if something goes wrong? Um, yeah, I mean, from, from our perspective, it's, you know, it's obviously whoever's, um, you know, employing them. Um, I mean, most of our funding or all our funding goes to um, local NGOs. Um, and so any support to community scouts and rangers um, is, is through them. Um, and so the onus is is on them to to put in the right the, the, 
in place the right safeguarding measures um, and that is something that, that we look at um, but it I think that as Rohit says more needs doing in this area I mean I think more needs doing um, for, for you know um, government ranges too in terms of standard operating procedures um, I don't think there is one sort of you know um, common standard operating procedure manual that people can follow um, but there is work underway you know the likes of sort of you know African parks have been developing theirs over the years and you know and various others um, have their various sort of manuals and that they're developing and putting in place and we need to extend that to to um, community guards as well. Um, I'd also agree with Rohit in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of sort of community scouts and rangers. I mean, when I was talking earlier, I was sort of in a way sort of using the terms interchangeably. And of course, there, there, there is a key difference. And, you know, obviously where, where, where Simpson works, you know, a community, what is meant by community scout is, is very different to, um, to the scenario in, in Kenya where, you know, community rangers, conservancy rangers are much like, you know, uh, state authority rangers. So it depends on the sort of the, 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 the mandate um, that they are, they are given. It depends on the, con the context in which they work. It also, I think, um, really depends on the level of threat that they're trying to tackle. I mean, what hasn't come up in any of this discussion yet um, but which has been a big issue linked to obviously the, the, the human rights issue um, is a lot of the sort of the negative press, um, international press that Rangers have, have been, been getting and the, the, the concern that has been expressed about the sort of the over militarization of, of rangers um, and, and human rights abuses and, and, and such like. So I think that's something that, that, that needs to be uh, borne in mind and, and where you can, you know, where you don't have to arm rangers if that, you know, if, if, if that's not um, necessary to tackle the threat, then, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, then, then one then one shouldn't because, you know, arming rangers and going down that route can also sort of create that sort of distance for, between them and the community. So, yeah, um, yeah it, it's context specific. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Dan. And yeah, that issue about um, getting that balance right between rangers being able to protect themselves but also um, be becoming part of a, a bigger problem is a really fine one to strike I think. Simpson let's give you the last word if your internet is stable enough just any final thoughts from you or any personal experiences to share about these issues around safeguarding if something goes wrong and who's responsible for the rangers um, do, is SRT responsible for the rangers that it employs? Is it the conservancy? How does that work where you are? Um, okay, um, I must say that the rangers are actually employed by the conservancies. Um, but when it comes to going out to the field, that's where we make sure that we always have a armed, uh, trained police officer. So what we do is, I think Rohit or something mentioned there, two rangers and something like that. But what we did is we had an armed police officer, one person or two rhino, two SRT staff who are also trained, well trained, and then we had one community game ranger that's with them. So that's the team. Um, just to make sure, I mean, that that everybody is is, is protected by by the the, the the trained guy. So. Uh, but there is a team leader that has to take responsibility. Okay, great. Okay, thanks very much, Simpson. Um, just to say, I'm sorry we didn't manage to get to all the questions in the Q&A. There is going to be a blog following this webinar, and we'll try and pick up some more of the questions in the blog. There will also be a recording of it available. And, um, and as I said, the details of the case studies are available on the People Not Poaching website. Um, Liv, shall I hand back to you just for some closing words and then we can we can uh, end the webinar. Yeah, um, just a quick reminder before you go um, to follow People Not Poaching on Twitter and Facebook if you don't already. And you can also sign up to receive our newsletter on our homepage, which is peoplenotpoaching.org. Um, and you can also find several of the examples you heard about today by heading to our Explore tab on our website, um, where you can find all of our case studies. Um, 
And finally, um, if you are involved in, or you know someone who is in a project that you think sounds relevant to the People Not Poaching platform, then we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, and you can either head to our website um, and to our contribute tab, or you can email me on peoplenotpoaching at gmail.com or on my IID email address, um, as you can see on the screen now. So lastly, I just want to thank all of our excellent speakers and panelists for being here with us today and for all your thoughtful and insightful contributions to the discussion. Um, and I also want to thank all of the attendees for joining the webinar and for asking key questions and contributing to the discussion in the chat. Um, we will share a link um, to the recorded session on our website um, and Twitter soon. Um, so thank you again for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.